the king and magnify him for the Lord is good. It is he who has made us. We are his sheep, his people, the sheep of his pasture. And so, Father, we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. And we stand in the holy of holies, giving you all the honor, the glory, the worship, and adoration. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. You are Lord, you are God, and there's no one like you. Thank you for saving us, Lord Jesus, by your shed blood. We thank you. We thank you for coming from heaven in human form. God became flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word was made flesh. You became us that we may become you. Without sin, but you were made sin for us. That we may be made the righteousness of God. Thank you for this free gift. Thank you for your grace and your love. In the name of Jesus. And on this special day where around the world believers gather to remember your passion to remember your zeal, your determination to go to the cross, to take our sins, to take our sins. The perfect died for sinners that we may be reconciled to God. We say thank you, thank you, thank you. May the Lamb of God be praised forever. May the King of Kings be praised forever. The Lord of Lords Jesus be praised forever. Our everlasting Father be praised forever. Our mighty God be praised forever. The Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Great I Am, the Amen of God, the Faithful One, we bless you. Bread of life, we bless you. The Light of the World, we bless you. There is none like you. There is none beside you. Thank you. Thank you. Greater love has no man than this, that Jesus Christ will give his life for us. When we were yet sinners, he died for us. And you rose again to give us life. We say thank you. On this Palm Sunday, as I pray, I pray for Hosanna to be the portion of everyone. The word that means save us now, save us now. I pray that people will walk in the reality of redemption, in the vitality of redemption. Sinners will be saved, saints will be revived, the sick will be healed, the oppressed will be delivered, anyone stressed will be at rest today. Save now, rescue now, deliver now. In the name of Jesus, that people in the sanctuary and people around the world may say, This day, on this day, I experienced rescue. I received deliverance. I was blessed by God. He became my Hosanna in the highest. Salvation from God alone. And I give him praise. In Jesus' name. All who are grateful to God, thankful to him, say amen and give him a shout of praise. Yes, 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 yes. Hosanna. 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 Ah, we can, we can give that shout. <laughs> Hosanna. In the highest. Hallelujah. We know our Lord Jesus welcomes that. 
That, that we know. <laughs> that we know. Not only does he welcome that, but he said at the time that people objected to priests and, and religious people objected to the people crying Hosanna in the highest to him. You remember Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Well, I'm not going to let any stone, any rock out praise me. So somebody one more time, give him praise. Hosanna in the highest. And those of you at home, we can't hear you, but go ahead. He hears you. The Lord hears you. Yes, give him praise for your life. Amen. 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 To God be glory. To God be praise. Amen. 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 You may be seated, those of you in the sanctuary. Praise God. And those of you laying in bed, sit up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. If you wondered if I can see you, no, the Lord sees you. <laughs> Amen. We, we don't have that technology to see you <laughs> in, in your house. Amen. <laughs> uh, it's Palm Sunday, uh, and, and praise God. A week before the resurrection of Jesus, his death and resurrection, I like to preach to you about that. Amen. Uh, so... I guess almost every pastor in the world is doing something about Palm Sunday. So I'm going to join in, uh, but I want to title my message, The Triumphant Entry of Jesus into Our Lives. Amen. Praise God. We know that historically, uh, and as scripture tells us, on Palm Sunday, Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem. That is the natural, earthly Jerusalem in Israel. But you and I know that there is a spiritual Jerusalem. I'll just show you that verse, and then we'll go quickly to look at one of the references, one of the four references of uh, the triumphant, triumphant entry of Jesus, our Lord, uh, on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. All the Gospels actually... Uh, talk about the triumphant entry. It's one of the uh, few subjects and actions of Jesus that all four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John write about. A lot of the things Jesus said and did, they're recorded in what is called the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic uh, refers to Matthew, Mark, Luke 3. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because they seem to have similar optics. Optics to see. Sin optics. Sin is same. So they are seeing same. Or they are looking at the same thing through the same lens. That's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. John kind of stands out uh, from that group. Another way to remember them is Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to write from an earthly perspective about Jesus. But John writes about Jesus from a heavenly perspective. See the difference? So John is coming from the north. Mount Zion is in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. 
I'm just using these expressions to help you remember, you know, uh, he's coming from the north. The other three are coming from the south. North and south are opposite, right? So you remember, John is coming from heaven, his perspective. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are talking about Jesus as from the earthly perspective. So you see that they're, they're different. Yes? Most of you already know, and I, I use that in prayer today. Uh, you know John 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Amen? That's John 1.1. 1, 1. And the Word became flesh. So the Word that was with God and was God became flesh. That's in verse 14 of John 1. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Uh, very quickly, please don't let anybody deceive you or confuse you into thinking that Jesus Christ was the Holy Spirit at one point and Jesus Christ was God the Father at one point. No, it's not like that. Because in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. So if this is the Word, the Word was with, with, he was there with God. If I'm with you, there are two persons separate. All right? Jesus Christ is not God the Father. He is the Son of God the Father. Amen. And the only reason why he's the Son of God the Father, or actually the only begotten of God the Father, the only begotten Son of God the Father, is that God spoke his word to a virgin called Mary, and Mary received the word. So Mary conceived the word, God's word. And so what was conceived in her was the son of God, originated from God, came from God. That is how God is his father. Jesus was not fathered like the rest of us. And he was not born by a woman like the rest of us. He was born by a virgin. The rest of us are not born by a virgin. You understand that? All right. So it makes Jesus the seed of a woman. All the rest of us are the seed of a man. There's no human being who's the seed of a woman. Even though we're born by women, the seed came from a man. Without the seed, there can't be be conception you understand that yes but without the woman there can't be a birth you have to come into the earth through a woman to be human so for jesus to come for god to come and die for our sins he had to become human so he had to be born he, he couldn't just appear if he just appears like angels just appear or something disappears he's not human and he cannot die for our sins And, and angels are not human, so angels can't die to save us. And no human can die to save us because all humans are sinners. So the only one left, and animals are not human. They're not equal to us. So the only part left is God. So God had to find a way to come. And only God could have thought about that. He's just wise enough to figure out, okay, how can I become human but not the seed of a man? So the way he created everything by speaking his word, he almost like creates himself in the natural. I know I shouldn't kind of say it that way, but God created everything by speaking the word. So to be born into the world, he speaks the word into a woman who says, I receive. Let it happen to me as you have spoken. Amen. So the word now becomes flesh. Praise the Lord. So our Lord Jesus was God. And actually his name was the Word. 
His name as God was the Word. But the name Jesus was only given to him because of the work that he would do for humanity to save us. The name Jesus means Savior in his country on earth, that is Israel, and his mother, nobody called him Jesus. The name Jesus just came to us from the Greek, but they were not Greek people. <laughs> they were Hebrew. You understand this? Their language was in Greek. So Jesus was not called Jesus by anybody in, his, in Nazareth or Bethlehem. He was called Yeshua. The name actually existed before he was born. There's another man who was called that, at least one man. You know, there's a priest who was called that. But Joshua, Moses' assistant called Joshua. Moses' assistant called Joshua. His name is Yeshua. His full name is Yehoshua. You know, the Joshua in the Old Testament who was always around Moses, his name was not Joshua. His name was Yehoshua. And they shortened it to Yeshua. Yehoshua means God, our salvation, and was shortened to Savior. You understand? It's like, what's a short form for Michael? Mike. Yes? Okay, so in, in uh, like, you, you are Edwards, right? But we all call you what? Teddy. So there are names that have short forms. The name Yeshua is from Yehoshua. <laughs> Amen? Uh, Joshua has the same name as Jesus Christ, as Jesus. When Jesus was born and he was walking around, there were other people too who were called Yeshua. <laughs> He's not the only person who was called that. People were named after that. It's like uh, in Latin countries, you know, Hispanics. Can I say Hispanics? Latinos. Latinos. All right. Uh, there are people who have names just like Jesus' name. Jesus. Yeah, aren't some Latino people called Jesus? Some of them are even called Salvador. Isn't that right? Yeah. So, you know, there, there are people with who took on that name. The name existed before Jesus came because God was telling the people, Yeshua is coming. Yeshua is coming. In fact, when he came, people were always asking, you know, is that the Yeshua? Have you found the Yeshua? Is he the Yeshua? Is he the Messiah? You know, people were always asking that. So because they knew he was, he was going to come, you know. Mary, in fact, told the angel, let it be to me as you have said, because they had been taught as Jewish girls and Jewish, Jewish young people from the Torah, Moses' writings, that the Messiah was going to come. And every young girl in Israel hoped that she would be the mother, the chosen one. And one day this young girl gets favored by God. She was favored. Amen. So she's not the mother of God. Because the mother of God does not need favor. She was favored by God. If you are favored, you have a need. God doesn't have any need. So Mary is not God. Are we good? She's not the mother of God. Somebody said that, I think like in the 200s or 300 AD, and it just kind of came down and people now repeat that. But God doesn't have a, a mother. Amen. We learned that last week. Jesus is called both the root of David and the offspring of David. The only way that you can be the root of a tree and the fruit of a tree is that before the tree came, you existed. Come on. Root and offspring. Jesus is called the root. You know, the, the root of a tree. Yes? Before a tree bears fruit, you got to have first the root and then the, the stem will come up. And then the branches, then you get, you get the fruit. Yes? Jesus is the only person in the world that is called root of someone else and also the offspring of that same person. And the Jewish people were aware of this. 
they called him the son of David. Yes, so David was supposed to have the special son who would come to sit on the throne of David forever. So, and they expected this. This is not our history. It's their history. We just borrowed it. They gave it to the world. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, are the, these are the covenants, the prophets, the promises. And we just came to share in it. But they are the real olive tree, and we've just been grafted into it. Amen? Okay. All right, all right. Let's, let's look at Galatians 4. Just want to show you something about Jesus went into, uh, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. All right, he entered Jerusalem. Okay, I, I want to show you this in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 25 and 26. What I want is 26, but I'll just read 25 first. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Arabia, Saudi Arabia. And answers to, for those of you in the sanctuary, answers to what's the name, the next word there. Answers to Jerusalem. I just want you to say it. All right, I will explain. Which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So the Jerusalem which now is, is the Jerusalem in Israel. Are we good on that? Okay. And according to the Bible, now of course they're not going to agree especially the religious ones, the Orthodox Jews, they're not going to agree. But according to the Bible, they are in spiritual bondage right now. Right now. Verse 26, in contrast to the natural Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, there is another Jerusalem. Verse 26 but, what's the next word, church? Jerusalem. But Jerusalem. So you have to read on to see what he's saying. He's not referring to the first Jerusalem in 25. Because he says, but Jerusalem, which is where? Above. So there is a Jerusalem above. Yes? There's a Jerusalem in heaven. Yeah. The Jerusalem which is above is free. So the opposite will be the Jerusalem which is on earth is not free. Yes? Right now in 2024, Israel is doing what now? Somebody tell me what something's going on there right now. There's war. Is that freedom? No. I'm not here to say it's wrong, right or wrong. We're just talking about a fact of something that's happening. And, and apart from that war, really, they don't really live in freedom. You know, when I visited uh, Israel many years ago, there were 16-year-old, 17-year-old young people who were in the military. You know, their normal life, they've gone to training, 16, 17, 18, gone to training, and their normal life, they, they have guns, and they're hanging around the street in a group, the garden. Then, I mean, why is it that well, it's not normal? I mean, there's some things we're all used to because this is our world, but it's, just, it's not a normal thing that, you know, you give birth to your child, they start living, and then, you know, your 18-year-old has to carry a gun. I mean, why? Why? Let them go play soccer let them play with computer let me let them live their lives go to the mall let them start a business but gun why it's not normal we accept a lot of things we get used to them 
but you and I are the light of the world. I'm talking about believers. We are the light of the world, and we need to take certain things seriously and pray about them to bring God's will. Thy will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. To pray God's will into our communities. Bring God's will into our families. Don't just live your life and accepting things because, well, okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, let it be well. That's just how the world is today. No. It doesn't have to be that way. It's like Satan is just pushing us into a corner. And we need to, we have to, we keep compromising, compromising, keep going down. And our leaders keep compromising. Now they want to put, uh, what's the thing that you put? Uh, they put it, you know, you go in the airport and screens you to find guns and that sort of thing. They want to put some in the schools. Detectors. You know, why, why, why is it that a normal society should now be in a place where to protect kindergarten, elementary school children, we have to put gun detectors, metal detectors, whatever they call it, at the entrance. Why? I mean, is this how far we have sunken? Can't our leaders, I mean, don't they think there should be be another way? I mean, is this really, is this, is this how high we can think? How wise we can become? You know, like, well, let's fight over, well, what kind of gun is acceptable that the citizens can be allowed to have and, and all of that. And that's our fight. And we think, well, we're the smartest ones. Really, can, can we think different? Isn't there another way? I'm challenging you today. You're either going to be crying Hosanna to God to save you. Do it your way. Or you settle on the earthly plane. And when you settle on the earthly plane, you are living in bondage, but you don't even realize it. Same as I just told you, if I go to Israel, I'm talking to some um, Orthodox Jew, or to the people just living their lives. And I tell you, do you guys know you actually live in bondage? You're like, no, I'm not bound. We get an attitude about these things. But according to scripture, they are living in bondage. That is, this is not how God wants them to live. But you can be so blind, you don't even see it. It is not a normal thing that a nation should train 18-year-olds to guard the nation. It is not normal. It is not a normal thing that school boards and the, uh, the, the big people there have to decide what kind of bathrooms six-year-olds will have, six-year-old girls will have, six-year-old boys will have, and what, what kind of... It is not normal. Where, where, uh, what is wrong with us now? It, it, it is not. What happened to us? Something is seriously wrong with the way we are living, but we are so blind, we don't even see it. Oh, Palm Sunday is going to open our eyes. So here, listen to God. He says, the Jerusalem which is above is free. God is not bound. He is free. He said, you, you all are bound. You don't even know it. Come to me and I'll set you free. We saw the scripture. Jesus, you know, said it. We saw it last week for those who are not here. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's part of scripture. He said, um, uh, you know, from Psalm 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, his canopy, his covering, his wings. He said, I have sought to protect you, to bring you under my covering. All day long, my hand is stretched out to help you, but you're stubborn, you want to listen, and you get away from my covering, and you get hurt. He said, I've always wanted to protect you. You're just always doing your own thing, going away from me, farther and farther and farther away from God, and into bondage, don't even realize that we are in bondage. Just so you, you understand this, and we'll look at it in the scriptures. On the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, we all know the cry. The people said, Hosanna. 
that means save us now. But you know what they were saying? Save us from the Romans. That is, that is the major cry, the major reason for their cry. They are saying we are under the Romans and we want to be free. So they wanted Jesus to become a king, like a political king who set them free. And this is where Christians in America, those of you in the world, all over the world, forgive me, I'll just, I'm in America, I'll address my church, and then I'll come back to you. This is where a lot of the Christians in America are now. Today, we think politicians are our saviors. And we are fighting over it. And we're so blind, we don't even realize it that we have joined those who are in bondage. We live in a way that is not God's way. I'm talking about born again believers. God never meant for politicians to be our saviors. Never, never. He wants to be your God. Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem was a triumphant entry into the hearts and the lives of the people. He was telling them, I have come to become king spiritually over your life. They're like, no, we want you to give us food. I know I went somewhere else, but it's somewhere in the Bible, all related. There's a time they wanted to make him king, force him to become king, and he got away from them. He said, you know why you want me to be king? It's because I multiplied food for you. So they're just thinking about their stomachs. You know? Yeah, they wanted him to become king because you're only thinking about the earthly, the natural, the physical, the temporal, that which will pass away. You eat today, you eat tomorrow. You eat the next day. These are temporal things. What matters is the spiritual first. Fast forward, another example to show you the importance of spiritual things. Let's say that all of us here in this room and everybody listen, watching, listening to me, lives to say 150 years and you die. You know, let me give you 150, not even 120. I'll give you 150. After 150, you're not going to be on earth. But that's not the end of you. They put your body somewhere, whether they burn it to ashes, Oh, from dust, it goes back to dust. <laughs> Listen, it doesn't matter what kind of dust it is. God can raise it up. Whether it's ashes dust or brown dust gray, or, or great, I don't know what different colors but it turns to. But whatever color it turns to. Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> Let's say that, if you're a Christian, let's say that somebody got cremated, you know, so ashes. God can raise those ashes the same way he can raise brown dirt. Do you understand that? Okay. Whatever dirt, I don't know what the body becomes, whether it becomes brown or black or pink or yellow. I don't know. The medical people, God bless you. But the point is, whether... It was burnt to ashes, cremated, or buried. The dust, God will raise the dust. Amen. We're good? Okay. But the real person wasn't buried. The real person is out of the body. And that part of the, of the person lives forever. Because God did not mean for the body to die, one day God will raise the body up. And that's what I meant, whether it was burned, the person died in a fire, or it was cremation, or they got buried, or they died even at sea. It isn't, we're talking God here. <laughs> he's, he's going to give the person a new body. And it's called a glorified body. Amen. So, when we bury somebody, we lay the body down to await the resurrection. Amen. In fact, whether they are born again or not, the body awaits a resurrection. The born again body, uh, the, the body of the born again person is, awaits a resurrection to life. And, uh, and, uh, tragically, the body of the person who rejected God 
is raised to a place where, because they said, God, I don't want to be with you, they're going to be in a place where God is not. Amen. We know God is omnipresent, everywhere present. But I tell you, teach you something. There's one place God is not. It's called the lake of fire. He ain't there. I mean, I mean he is not there. Amen. Or you prefer the other way. He ain't, he ain't ever going to be there. Amen. All right. Well, but I thought Jesus went to hell for us. Yes, he went to that hell, so you don't ever have to go there. But there's a difference between that hell and there's a second hell. Do you all know that? Is there anybody here who you didn't know that? Oh, there is a second one. <laughs> you think the first one is bad enough? There's a second one. And, and the first one is going to be transferred. It's going to be relocated. They will move from Washington, D.C. to Texas. Yeah, it's going to... Uh, just saying, uh, don't be mad. I'm just, just saying, Texas isn't hell. I'm just, okay. <laughs> Why do I even do this myself? Okay. Is it, I don't mean, I just mean it will go from one place to another. Okay, forget it. Revelation, <laughs> Revelation 20. I think you got, you got my point. Revel, let me sh just show you this. My sister here, she says she doesn't know, so I'll show you. There are two hells. Revelation 20, 14. Just quickly find it. Revelation 20, 14. When you find it, say amen. Re Revelation, yeah, chapter 20 and verse 14. And death and hell. Did you see this? Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the, do you see second? Uh-huh. Second death. The first, if there's a second, there's a first. This is my second born. That means there's a first born. Second death, first death. All right. Hell is the first one. You won't be there. Amen. And there's a second one. Okay. Did you all see in, when we're in Galatians, that there's a Jerusalem above? Okay. Since we're here in Revelation, I'll just show it to you, and then we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about Palm Sunday proper. So, uh, Revelation, go to chapter 21, please. Just, just the next page. Verses 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. Honestly, this is the only thing that bothers me about the Bible. I don't understand it. I don't get why. But it just bothers me personally. Because I like the ocean. And I don't really get why <laughs> when God makes the new earth and new heavens, why there's not going to be any more sea. I kind of have an idea why, but it just personally bothers me. Because I would have loved an oceanfront property <laughs> when we get back. <laughs> but do you, do you all see that? Maybe I'm the only strange one, but this just bothers me. Like, and there was no more sea. Do you ever know? Do you ever know? Read this, anybody? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not the only one odd here. One old one out. But it doesn't bother you. Yeah. But I kind of feel like for those who like the ocean, God's going to give you create a personal one for you. <laughs> hey man, He's going to that. That that's going to be because even in Michigan, you know, there's there's something you know lakes that look like oceans. Yeah. So God has a way of still. Satisfying, but it's still like bothers me like that. This big whole ocean thing is not going to be there anymore. Yeah. 
But I kind of feel like maybe all the people who have believed in God over all these generations who died, when they come back, they got to live somewhere. And so God's going to take the sea, the area where the ocean was, and they're going to have houses there. Right? I mean, think about it. Like from since Adam and Eve, Abel's time, all the righteous people, all the way to Zechariah in the Old Testament, and coming all the way to Jesus come, all these people, where are they going to live? Yeah. Okay, say, so pastors, let, don't let it bother you when we get there. Yeah, I know, but I mean, he wrote it here, so I might, I, I, I want to find out. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave that alone. Verse 2. And I, John, saw, now I need you, I need you to know this verse too, though. And I, John, saw the holy city, read, New Jerusalem. So this Jerusalem thing has always been something on God's mind and heart. I saw New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, dressed up, decorated, designed, adorned for her husband. Wow. Why don't we read verse 3? Because it connects to Palm Sunday. Verse 3. So you see, there's, there's a new Jerusalem, yes? Heavenly Jerusalem. And is our mother. She's described as a female. Amen? I, I won't start something. I was going to tell you that she's the bride of Christ. But then I have to spend time explaining. So I won't, t I won't say that. But the Bible says that. Amen. So for those who are curious, then go read the Bible. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. What does tabernacle mean? A tabernacle is a tent, like a house, you know, a, that you can carry. You, you, do you know there's some houses they can put on their trailer and then drive to a place and put there? Yeah. So a tabernacle is like that. It's a, it's a whole big tent carrying around, right? So it says the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And he shall wipe away, I'm reading verse 4, wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Say amen. All right. When Jesus came to Jerusalem that day on Palm Sunday before he went to the cross a few days later and resurrected a week later. When he was entering Jerusalem, he was saying this, I'm coming to tabernacle. I'm coming to make my tent. I'm coming to live with you. How will I do that? I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to be raised from the dead. And if you believe in me, I and my father will come and live tabernacle, live inside of you. Amen. We'll bring heaven into you. Praise God. Now, of course, what we read here is in the future. All right. It's in the future. But he was telling us that I want you to have a foretaste of what is to come. Amen. One day, God Almighty himself will come and be with us. I mean, you can, uh, finally, we can see him face to face. Nobody's ever seen God's face. But one day, we'll see him face to face. And in case you actually thought that human beings are going to go and live in heaven forever, no. That's what the Bible teaches. Heaven is going to move down to the earth after God makes the new earth. 
and the new heavens wherein dwells righteousness forever and ever. He is actually the one who's going to move his country and bring it down. I'm not making this up. We just read it. We, we just literally just read it. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't think that you're going through a hard time and say, God, I'm going through a hard time. Just come and take me home, you know, and I just, I just want to escape. No, he did not get you born again to live defeated. He doesn't want you to think that, you know, heaven is an escape from suffering on earth. No. Palm Sunday was to tell the people, I can live with you, and when I tabernacle among you, you have victory. I will wipe away your tears. What brings you sorrow, I'll give you joy. What has brought you sickness, I'll bring you healing. All the perfection we're going to have later, his coming was to tell them, give them a foretaste of that perfection. And so I'm challenging you to receive Jesus as Lord. Even if you've received him as your savior, make him Lord of your life. And today he said, Lord, help me to think differently about my life and this world. And as I engage this world, if I'm walking the ways of the world, natural ways that bring me defeat, Deliver me and give me your wisdom so that while here on earth, I will walk not by my ways, my thoughts, but I'll walk by your ways and your thoughts. For as you said in Isaiah 55, your ways are not my ways, our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. As the heavens where the new Jerusalem is, as the heavens are so high above the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways? I am challenging you today on this Palm Sunday. You, maybe you never thought of it that well. Maybe you have, fine, thank God. But when he entered Jerusalem, all the people were thinking, he set us free from Rome. And he's saying, no, I didn't become, I didn't, I didn't come as a political king. Didn't he say, my kingdom is not of this world? If my kingdom were of this world, I would have sent, asked for just one legion of angels. 12,000 angels. In the Bible, there was one angel who killed 185,000 Syrians who had come against the Jews. One angel. I mean, he was like, pew, pew, and, and that was it. 185,000 gone like that. And Jesus, I can call 12,000. I can call a legion of angels. But he had brought the kingdom of heaven into the hearts of people. We are mere flesh, but the excellency of God's power is available to work in you. You can be sick and the power can make you well. What joy I had this week when Sister Jeanetta's brother John called me and he said, I went to see, says, Pastor, thank you for praying for me. Thank you for giving me those scriptures. I read them every day. I, and I said, you read them day and night. Healing scriptures. Read them day and night. We pray for him right here. Read them day and night. He says, I went to see my cardiologist. And he says, my heart is fine. Heart is fine. Heart is fine. I remember our sister Jeanetta calling me, crying, said, Pastor, they said, touch and go. John might not make it. John is alive. And John told me where he walks, and he put me to shame. I was like, I started talking to myself. I was like, you got to pick it up. When he told me where he walks, I was like, oh, my God. He said, I, do that. I just do that every day. So I came and I was just telling his sister, I said, you know, your brother called me and he's telling me where he walks. She said, yeah, in fact, I'm trying to tell him to cut it down, you know, because he really walks. And he said, my doctor said, you're doing fine. Keep doing it. Heart is healed. Touch and go. He was about to die. Heart is healed. The tabernacle of God is with men. 
We are talking about Jesus who enters Jerusalem and he's telling the people, I have new Jerusalem. Have what I've brought to you is free. It's liberty. If the Son of God sets you free, you are free indeed. Don't be part of the crowd who just cry out and call on him or even touch him, but you're not touching him with faith. Don't be, you know, there are people who go to church. They just go to church. It's just religion. They just, they just go through this, but there's, Christ is not a living reality to them. Don't, don't be like, be different. Be different. Let your attitude be like, I mean, don't have her situation. The woman who had the issue of blood bleeding for like, was it 12 years? Don't have a situation, but have a faith. She came and touched Jesus in faith because she had read from the Torah that the priests are supposed to be carrying God's word in a box attached to the tassels of their garment. And if you touch it, the word, you'll be well. The only reason why she touched it is because it had been said are you following me? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. She touched it because God had said it. So when she was touching in her heart and mind, she says, if I touch the word, I'll be well. So she touched and immediately unknown to Jesus that somebody was about to touch him. And that's the beauty of it. Jesus is going, all kinds of people are touching him. And then he stops. And he said, somebody touched me. And the disciples says, but Lord, look at the crowd. Everybody's touching you. He said, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me. You know? And you can say touch in such a way that they know, no, this, this touch is different. Yes? Yeah. God forbid, but if a child goes to a babysitter, and the child comes back and says, somebody touch me a certain way. Don't shut the child down. Listen. Pay attention. There's a touch, and there is a touch. Did somebody get that? And don't say because of finances, well, you know, they, they lowered their charges for me, so I keep the No. No. That day, your child doesn't go back to that babysitter Oh, that, that, that's the end of it. Don't shut the children up or down. Listen to them. Amen? Yeah, I was going to tell you something. I went somewhere and I forgot where I was going with this. But that's all right. Amen. I love it how you, when you preach in a, what they call like a black church, you know, and they say, that's all right. <laughs> oh, I just, that's all right. <laughs> Uh, can you tell me? Can you tell me that? That's, ah, yes. Oh, you came back. I was just talk, talking about your brother, John. Hallelujah. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Glory. Yeah, glory. Amen. But you and I have to start walking because John is putting me to shame. <laughs> he will heal you. He will help you. Okay. Amen. All right. Come with me, please. Let's go see Palm Sunday. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. I'm going to start from verse 1, please. Matthew 21. And when you go home, just read, read it over. Uh, so I'm just going to pick and choose certain verses. Highlight them. Hallelujah. All right. Let's look at where they said Hosanna, you know, just very quickly. Uh, so I'll read uh, verse 8. I just want to take you to where they said Hosanna. Verse 8 and 9. Uh, or 8 to 10. Okay, 8 to 10. So math, uh, Matthew 21, 8.
It says, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried saying, what? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Saying, who is this? The multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Okay, so I read verse 11. All right. Now, he entered Jerusalem. This is called the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But we have seen a new Jerusalem. All right. And I want to use that to show you that there is a way, what, the way God looks at things is different from how we look at things. Right. On this day, when the people were crying out, Hosanna may save us now. They were crying out for salvation from the Romans. Most of them. You know, maybe a few people were like the woman uh, with the issue of blood who touched Jesus in faith. Maybe one or two people were saying, heal my heart now, like John got healed. Amen. Somebody had hemorrhaging and had come, save me now. Somebody had financial problems and maybe was quoting the scripture, send prosperity now, send now prosperity. That's also another Hosanna. So maybe somebody had a financial problem. And so, yeah, in the crowd, I'm sure there were people with, you know, a few people with little here, problems here and there, and they may have been asking for deliverance from some physical problem. Are you with me? But largely, the crowd crying out, save us now, were seeking for salvation or rescue from the Romans. They, the Romans are oppressing us, and we want to be free. Jesus had come to establish his spiritual kingdom in their hearts. They didn't see that. They wanted natural deliverance. Okay, let's, let's, do, let's do a scripture. I know you know the history, but let's do a scripture that brings it out. In Acts 1, in Acts 1, uh, those who don't know it, I'll show it to you. Those who know it, you remember just before Jesus went to heaven, He's telling his disciples the last day. You know, everybody's, you know, like final before they leave. Their final words, very important. And he's been telling them, go into the whole world, preach the gospel and all that. But you're going to find out in Acts 1 that even his disciples, their mind was still on deliverance for Israel from oppression, you know, under the Romans. So Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Do you all see this? Okay, was that important to Jesus? All right, so Jesus is talking about spiritual power. Yes? You'd be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You get spiritual power. Skip for a moment to verse 8. What does the spiritual power do? Verse 8, Acts 1, 8. Church, what does the spiritual power do in verse 8? It says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Do you all see this? Okay. So power comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Power doesn't come from you laying an offering at my feet. And all those gimmicks. It's just ridiculous. The power comes from the Holy Spirit. 
It doesn't come from going to give your archbishop or your bishop or your general or whatever titles men have today an offering. Go and support their ministry, support their work, but don't think you're going to buy the power of God because you might bring a curse on yourself. You can read that later. That's in Acts chapter 8. Some guy wanted to buy the power of God. And Peter said, your money perish with you. It's in Acts 8. Read it later. I'll leave that alone. Stop buying blessings. And pastors and ministers, okay, you're different here. So I'm preaching to the choir. But those out there, especially the young ones who are coming up, stop telling people. Stop copying some of the people you respect who, who do this. They, they have healing lines where they ask people to give $10,000, then they get a special blessing for their business or their healing or whatever. Stop it. That's not God. That's making merchandise of God's people. And God's going to deal with them. When we were sinners, Christ died for us. Freely you have received, freely give. What's all this thing, you know? You buy, you sow a seed, and God will give you this, this transactional thing. God doesn't do that. Romans 8, if he gave us Jesus, will he not together with him freely, thank you, Minister Oscar, freely give us all things. It's free, just ask. People don't get because they don't ask. We ask God to heal John's heart. Sister Janita, you are here, aren't you here? And what happened to your brother? Hallelujah. Oh, I didn't even know that part. They opened his chest twice, left it open overnight. The open overnight part, yes, I knew about that, and we're praying. Yeah. To God be the glory, sister. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I don't want to embarrass you by putting you on camera for everybody to see you, but you can hear her rejoicing. A brother's heart is healed. You remember when you called me and you said, Pastor, this is touch and go. We, they said we might lose John. But God. Ah, come on. Somebody give Jesus praise. Hosanna. Come on. It's Palm Sunday. Be free. Don't, don't be rigid. Be free. Just give him praise. And as you give him praise, may your healing come. As you give him praise, receive your healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In fact, if you want a transaction, I'll give you a biblical transaction. God says, when you give him praise, he gives you more grace to perform more miracles. So if you want a transaction, do what? Give God praise. And he'll give you more grace. Somebody give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you're watching and you've been diagnosed with a heart condition, you're watching me right now. Put your hand on, on your heart. Or if it's a child or a spouse, put your hand on them right now as we thank God and celebrate the victory of John right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for this wonderful thing you did for our brother John. We give you praise that you gave him a new heart. Hallelujah. So even now, Lord, tabernacle, live mightily in that child, in that spouse, who, whose spouse lay, just laid hands upon them in agreement with me. Not my might, not my power, but the name of the Lord Jesus. Touch that person and heal their heart now in Jesus' name. And as we pray, even as we pray for hearts to be healed, we say anything else from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Tabernacle mightily in them. Lord, live mightily in them. In the name of the Lord Jesus, walk in them. Heal them. Deliver them. Let them experience Hosanna now. In Jesus' name, receive your healing. Be healed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, we believe in physical healing. We believe in divine healing. We believe that God heals the sick. And we also believe it is his will to heal. 
So we never pray, if it be thy will, because we know it is his will to heal. How do we know it is his will? Let's start from the natural. He gave brains to human beings, doctors to help people. We know it is his will. We know that. Let's just, de- even in the natural, we know that. He's given us hospitals, technological advancements. We know that it is his will. And then beyond that, we know it is his will because the Bible says in Isaiah 53, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. In Isaiah 53, it says in verse 10, it pleased God to bruise him for us. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. It was the crown of thorns he wore, and by his stripes we are healed. Amen. Don't let any pastor tell you that is spiritual healing. It's not spiritual healing. Sinners are not sick. Sinners are dead. Let me, re- <laughs> Let me repeat that. Sinners are not sick. Sinners are dead. Ephesians tells us in chapter 2, we were dead in sins and trespasses. Sinners are dead, so they have to be raised up. You raise the dead. You don't heal the dead. You can't heal a dead person. They're dead. You raise the dead. Amen. When they are raised and they are sick, you heal the sick. In the Bible, Jesus healed people physically. Did he open blind eyes? Yeah, phys- that was physical, wasn't it? Doesn't the Bible say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? So why don't we believe him that what he did then, he'll do today? Well, doesn't he say somewhere, I know it's James 5, that he said he's sick in the church, let them do what? I read somewhere, oh, I, mean, I love black churches when they preach. They know it, but say, I read somewhere. It's just written somewhere. Oh, I love it. Don't you love it? And when T.D. Jakes is just moving and just, I just was like, yeah. Oh, but you got to be born here to be able to do that naturally. I have tried that. It does not come. <laughs> I've tried that. So I just do me. <laughs> I, just, I just love that. I mean, just... Oh, anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I just do me. But I, I like it. It's, it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's like a dance, you know, the way they're preaching, moving, and the flair. I'm like, man, these guys got it, man. They use the same thing when they play basketball. You know, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. Don't you think? Ah, ah, I can't do it. I can't do it. So let me do me. All right. So we know in James 5, he says, Lady sick in the church, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil, representing the Holy Spirit. Let them pray the prayer of faith. He didn't say the prayer of unbelief in James 5. He said the prayer of faith. Confidence, certainty. Amen. And the Lord will save, heal the sick person and raise them up. Read it in James 5 from verse 13 to verse 17. And you're going to see that he says, watch this. He said, and if, watch this, he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven. So far, he's been talking about healing the sick. Raising the sick. Then after they are raised, then he goes on to say, and if he has committed sins. So before, everything he was talking about was not sin. It was physical. Am I teaching well? Ah, yes, 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 yes. Physical healing. In Matthew 8, verse 14, it says, when the evening was come, they brought to Jesus all that were sick, and he healed them that it might be fulfilled what was written, that himself bore our sins and sicknesses, and by his stripes we are healed. This is Matthew 8, 
verse 14 to verse 17. He healed people, physically healed. And he said that it might be fulfilled what Isaiah said. So what Isaiah said was in reference to physical healing. He himself bore our sins, one, and bore our sicknesses, two. By his stripes, Peter writes and he says, by his stripes, you were healed. If you were healed, then God no longer is saying, ah, will I heal you or not? You've already been healed. Now you and I have to believe God like the woman with the issue of blood. Believe that if I touch the word, I'll be healed. How do I touch the word today? Read it later. I'll just quote it. But in Proverbs 4, verse 20 to 23, you touch the word by attend to the word. Incline your ears to the word. Look at it. Don't let it depart from your eyes. Look at it. Think in line with the word. Meditate on it. For the word getting into you will become medicine to all your flesh. The word will become medicine to all your flesh. John meditated on the word. Meditated on the word. We laid hands on him just one time. Prayed for him at home. But gave him scriptures on healing. To meditate on morning and night. I told him do that. I asked him. He said, I did it, Pastor. Wow. And the word was working. Working. I'm telling you, let the word tabernacle in you. And you wipe away the tears. Let the word tabernacle in you. And the weakness will leave. His word is power. His word is life. For his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of spirit, soul, bone, and marrow. It can enter into your blood and heal you of blood diseases. His word heals of cancer. His word drives out diabetes. His word, yes, it does that. It can regularize, regularize and normalize your sugar level. I, mean, I understand we have to take care of ourselves in the natural and all that. I understand. You know me. I preach. The, I teach you these things. We bring people here to help you. We have a coach. We have another coach. Today I see coach. Say, yes, sir. Say hello. Coach, get you. Guys, we have another coach right there. I mean, you know me. I, I'm into this. You know, get... We were walking out to church today, and my wife said, why are you limping? And I said, that was from training yesterday. When I came back from training, she was asleep, and then I went to teach. And after teaching, you know, I'm tired, so I go to sleep, wake up, get ready for church. So she doesn't see me all that, and I get in church, and I'm getting the crisis. Why are you limping? I was like, yeah, that was from training yesterday. Hallelujah. So what did you do? I said, oh, well, they were just teaching us how to defend ourselves when somebody has a knife. I mean, there's a knife. So what do you do? I said, run away. <laughs> Actually, that was the first thing they told us. Somebody got a knife. This is the first thing, run away. And then they said, the second thing is, get a chair, if you have a chair, and put the chair between you and the person with the knife. Or anything that separates you, provides you distance. Did you catch that? Somebody has a knife, run away. If you can't run away, get any object that gives you distance between you and the person. So they can't lunge at you, yes? And that thing is your weapon. Even if it's your high heel. It's your weapon. And then we're taught finally, if you don't have anything, the next thing you do. And that was a part I had so much fun because I was taught that since I was 10 years old, judo. That, that, oh, yesterday was fun, and I forgot I was 63 years old. And I'm just going, I'm just going. And I'm coming back home, and my leg was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But I'm going back next Saturday. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, ladies and gentlemen, yes, I believe eat right, take care of yourself, and all that. But 
Let me teach you this. Get the word in you. The word works. Same way a doctor says, you just take these tablets and it's supposed to work in your body. The word, it's God's spiritual tablets. The word works. Amen. So what did you learn about Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday is Jesus coming into your life. And that's what he wanted the people to see. The king comes in. And any other thing that's bothering you has to bow. Praise God. What was sad was that God had actually told them, prepared them, given them pictures of it. So when Jesus came, he expected that they would know the king has come. But they didn't see it. But you see it. Because the spirit is now explaining it to you. Amen. So very quickly, let me show you where... God prepared them where he talked about Palm Sunday before it actually happened. One of the easy, clearest places is Zechariah 9 verse 9. So media, can you give us Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9? Zechariah. At this point, I'm going to need Chaplain Sandra to kind of help me. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. So we can flow, and then I, I can pray for you. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Praise God. So I want to show you places where God prepared them. You already told them, get ready. Palm Sunday is about to happen. It'll come one day, you know, to you all. All right, Zechariah, what did I say, 9, 9? All right, Miss, you have it? You have your mic? Can you help me, please? Yeah. Uh, King James Version? Yes, yes, that's fine. Yes. Zechariah chapter. Mm -hmm. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon the cult of a foal of a donkey. Okay. All right. So Zacharias said this like four or 500 years before Jesus came. He had said it. So you go to the synagogue or temple and you're taught this might have come up. Are we good so far? All right. In Matthew 21, where we see Palm Sunday, Matthew 21, this time I'm reading from verse 4. All this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, let your, look, your king is coming to you, humble, sitting on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So in Matthew 21, triumphant entry into Jerusalem, when it happened, what Jesus did, it says this was done to fulfill what had been spoken 400 years earlier. Yes? Okay. Uh, Pastor Sandra, give us John. Let's see. Is it John 12, verse 9? Uh, what does John talk about? I think John 12, verse 9, right? I just want to show you, let's see. John 12. John 12, verse 9. Uh, no, John 12. John 12, verse 12. Okay. John 12, I'll read it from my, my version. Thank you. On the next day, a great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took what? They took what? Branches of palm trees. Palm Sunday. So John actually is the only one who, the only gospel writer who tells us the type of tree was palm trees. And they went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, having found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Okay. In ancient times, when kings went to war and generals went to war, did they sit on donkeys? What did they sit on? Horses. Chariots, horses. Jesus, the king, is sitting on a donkey. So what's the, prob what's, the, what's the problem here? He's not coming to fight a natural battle. Sitting on a donkey, he's humble. He humbles himself, Philippians 2. He dies on the cross. Goes to the lowest of all, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Amen. So he already told them, your king will come, but he's not coming sitting on the horse to smash Rome. In Acts 1, where we read that he said, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When in verse 4, he said that, wait, not many days from now, you get the power. In verse 5, his disciples asked him, they said, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Can you imagine you train people in Bible college for three years? You ordain them. On the day you're ordaining them to send them to the, to the world, they say, uh, excuse me, pastor. So is America going to be saved by the Democrats or Republicans? I know I got you today and I'm feeling good, baby. I feel good. I knew that I would. You all need to repent. We need to really repent in America because we're not building God's kingdom. We want to build a kingdom for the Democrats or the Republicans. We think a political person is our savior. What world missions ministries minus us? You need to get your heart back. Jerusalem that is above is free. This one on earth is in bondage. Don't build any earthly kingdom. Get yourself back. You're giving your heart away to something that is not of the kingdom of God. The kingdoms of this world will not save us. We need the unity of the faith. We need to come together as one people. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God, one Father of us all. A nation divided against itself will not stand. I know I'm teaching the truth. It's not the voice that's being heard today, but I know this is the truth. Christ will unite us. Christ will save us. Whatever, it's not America alone, but wherever you live, Christ is the one who will save us. The King of our lives is Jesus Christ. He's the king of the nations. Men will come and go. Men will come and go. But he lives forever. I was telling you, even if you live for 150 years, your spirit will live forever. So it's more important that you choose now where your spirit is going to live forever than live for your flesh today. If you live for the joys and the pleasures of the flesh for 150 years and yet you lose your soul forever, what has it profited you? Receive Jesus as the king. Go to him. Let him enter your heart and your life as king. Your spiritual life is more important. We start from our spiritual life. And when that gets into place, then the anointing of the spirit begins to flow into your soul to help you recover your soul, renew your mind, transform you daily, and then heal your body and begins to shape your finances. You begin to get delivered from addictions and ways that you waste your money. Then you have wisdom about planning for your future, which we see here even in the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem. We just read it. He said that he sat on a colt. He sat on a donkey. Where did he get that donkey from? He had planned ahead of time. 
Come on, people, it's there. Maybe you didn't think about it, but he planned ahead of time. He planned for it. Amen. He didn't come here as God and just, just living anyhow and it's just going to happen. No, he planned for it. He knew exactly where the donkey was going to be. Whatever needed to do in the spirit realm, whatever arrangements that God does, you know, God's way. I don't know how he does, but the God thing. You know, I mean, that was really a God thing. Because you don't just tell your disciples, go over there. He directed them. You go to that place, there is a, a fork in the road. One road goes to the left, the other goes to the right, that corner. You're going to see a tree there. You're going to see a donkey tied. Nobody ever sat on it. How did he know all that? That's a God thing. He arranged all of that before the day he, he was to ride on it. In fact, he arranged it from eternity. And 400 years before it happened, he had a prophet prophesy it. And then when he comes in the earth, he does the way God does. I don't know how they do it, but he does his God thing. And then he tells his disciples, go and tell the person who owns it in the natural. The master wants it. Tells the guy, the guy says, okay. What was that? He had already prepared it. Amen. So don't let us just live our lives. You just anyhow, and you're not preparing for tomorrow. Oh, well, God's going to have. No, you need the wisdom of God. To prepare for the cult, you're going to ride on when you get there. I love you, church. God bless you. Give God praise. I pray that the spirit of the Lord will enter your heart in a special way today. I know you're born again, but I'm talking about a new anointing, new oil, fresh oil come upon you. The Bible says in Psalm 92, even in old age, he will give us new anointing. No, he'll give you, not us, you. He give you because I'm in my youth. Amen. But he said, even in old age, he'll give you new oil, new anointing. He'll renew your youth in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray that the spirit of the Lord will enter your life in a very special way today. In the name of Jesus, that the eyes of your spirit, your understanding will be enlightened. That today you will know the hope of your calling. That your hope will be revived once again. In the name of the Lord Jesus, that today you know the power of the resurrected Jesus. That is at work within you. The excellency of the power is of God, not of men. I pray that supernatural power will be exerted in your life to drive out infirmity. Drive out sickness. To drive out addictions. In the soul, bondages in your soul be driven out by the anointing of God in Jesus' name. Even things that you've been told is in the family. Your family history, they told you, indicates that there's this disease awaiting your family. Maybe not you, but somewhere else in the family. I stand to declare today in the name that is above every name that the Lord release upon you. And I pray for you that the Lord release the anointing that destroys the yoke and removes the burden. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may the power of the Spirit come upon you and upon your household. I use you as a point of contact in prayer for your household. In Jesus' name, and may the anointing destroy that yoke Remove the family history of diabetes, the family history of cancer, the family history of whatever ailment there is. Whatever bondage of this earthly Jerusalem be set free in Jesus' name. And the anointing of God liberates you today. Receive your miracle. Receive your breakthrough in Jesus' name. And let's all say today, thank you that you are our Yeshua, our Savior. But I make you Lord of every area of my life. I make you Lord of my mind. That's my thoughts. I make you Lord of my actions. I make you Lord over my words. Thank you, Jesus. Today I receive you in my heart, enthroned. I'm already born again, or if I'm not, today I receive Jesus. But as a born again Christian, I get off the throne of my life, and I ask you to be enthroned as Lord. Thank you that where you are welcome as Lord, there is liberty. 
I receive it today. My liberty, my deliverance, my rescue, my salvation, my healing, my blessing. I receive it to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' matchless name, by the faith of God, I call it done. And on this Palm Sunday, I say, now with understanding, by faith, Hosanna in the highest. I say it now, Hosanna in the highest. Not in the lowest, but in the highest. Not the things of the low place, but in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. I say Hosanna in the highest. Salvation from the Most High God. Excelsior, ever upward, ever forward, from glory to glory. Gloria a Dios, glory to God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, glory in the highest. Gloria Excelsior, glory in the highest. I receive salvation. It is from sin and all the effects of sin. If you're already born again, that's good. But you can still have salvation. That is rescue for your finances. Rescue from confusion of mind. Rescue from whatever was chasing the family. It has stopped. Accidents. Been killing people in the family. It's over. It is over in the name of the Lord Jesus. Drug addiction, chasing the men of the family, over for you today, in the name of Jesus. Ah, it's done. Somebody has a problem with your back, like the waist part, your, your waist. I just felt it now, there's healing. There's healing. In the name of Jesus. I don't know whether you're online or you're in the church. If you're online, receive it. If you're in the church right here, just stand up and then begin to bend down or do what you could not do because the Lord has healed you. You can do it now and thank him for it. If you're home, start exercising yourself. Do what you could not do previously. The Lord has healed you. That waste problem is gone. And for those who had back problems, the revelation I got was for the waste. The word of knowledge was the waste. You're healed. But even if you have a back problem, receive your healing now. Hosanna to you. Salvation from the highest one in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. Give God praise. I love you, church. God bless you. Ah, give him praise. Yes. Let's give him praise. Give him praise. <laughs> Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Hallelujah. I know we don't have palm branches here, but you can wave your handkerchief or something. When I was a child, I met at this church. My grandmother's met at this church. They used to walk through the town on Palm Sunday, waving palm branches. Come, somebody wave something. Wave your handkerchief or wave your hand. Let your hand be palm branches to God. Hallelujah. Tabnacling among, me, among us. Amen. Glory. Oh, in the house, say, say glory. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let me pray for your finances and then we give to God. You see on the screen, those online, how you can give to God. Father, thank you for all you've done today and you will do for us. We give honor and glory to you. Thank you that the lost have been now found saved, sick, healed, the oppressed delivered. We thank you. We're going away encouraged, knowing that Jesus has entered our hearts. By his resurrection, he has triumphed over the enemy for us. And we thank you. Cause your people to triumph in every place by the name that is above every name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We give tithes, offerings, gifts of love, thanksgiving, offerings, everything that's on our heart. We give cheerfully, joyfully, and by faith to you, Father. In Jesus' name, thank you for the corresponding return on our seat zone. Thank you for blessing us to be a blessing to others. As individuals in the ministry, we declare all our needs are met according to your riches and glory by the name Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glad you. Glory to God. Give praise to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to see on your screen... Three ways that you can give uh, to support the work of God here in World Missions Ministries. 
I know you can read it online, but there are people who are listening only uh, on our phone line. So I will say it. This for them, Zell, 571-234-2387. Zell to World Missions Ministries, the number is 571-234-2387. You can give online on our website, wmmchurch.org.org. wmmchurch.org. Just click the donate button and give as you choose. It's secure through PayPal. If you choose to give that way, God bless. Also, you may send a check in the mail to World Missions Ministries. The address here is 6805 East Clinton Street, Clinton, Maryland, 20735. For those overseas, it's USA. I repeat, 6805 East Clinton Street, Clinton, Maryland, 20735. Thank you. God richly bless you. We're here. The word comes to you at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I just told you the address. You're welcome to join us for service. Praise and worship is at 1030, but we don't broadcast that because we sing other people's songs. We can only broadcast what is our song. So that's why you don't see that online. But you're welcome to join us uh, in the sanctuary, 1030 for praise and worship, and the word comes at 11. I want to thank you for your support. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless. Hallelujah.